The following is a presentation of Nova Hackers at ShmooCon Epilogue 2014. Hosted by Mach 37. Brought to you by Compute Cycle. <laughs> See, look at that. That's skill right there. All right, so Attacker Ghost Stories. I kind of did this a little bit at a small conference called ShmooCon just recently. Um, like we're bigger. <laughs> um, so this is a little bit about me. Uh, these are my kids. They're awesome. They're cooler than you guys. I'm sorry. Um, father, husband, Nova Hacker. Those are the search that I really. Strong armed all of you into being here. Um, but we're here for, you know, to learn and get better at defense, attack, lobby con. I forgot to remove all this from my uh, ShmooCon portion, but there's no gits here. Um, but basically, I'm a, I'm a security tree hugger. What, what does that really mean? A security tree hugger, for me, is I just want to make this world a better place. I bought into all of the 80s and 90s movies that said, you know, here's the protagonist that always gets the girl and always saves the day and stuff. So I believe that actually works. Yeah, you can call me stupid for that. But um, what's really important is, is that we... Um, use sort of the, the ideals of that and, and transition it into the security world. I am I'm sick and tired of the they're going to break in so let's just you know someone's someone's gonna break into my organization let's concentrate on the instant response or let's concentrate on the on the post intrusion detection or the IOCs I am sick and tired of the like roll over and die mindset so I this whole presentation is about things that you can stop them at the at the boundaries, right? Don't let them get that far. Uh, and the way I do this is is sort of the ideal that Emet started, and I'm going to be talking about Emet a lot in a little bit. But Emet is basically a protection that says um, here's the commonalities of all all of the different type of memory corruptions. These, like you can you can hit any bug you want. But as soon as you hit that bug and try to make it exploitable, there's only a set number of paths that you can go with that. And those paths are blocked by emit. And we'll be talking about that in a second. So emit, what is emit? Emit's basically a free tool or emit or however you want, E-M-E-T, however you want to say it, it still does the same thing. Um, it's basically a big bouncer that sits in front of the applications you tell it to since it's an opt-in application. Um, and and installs a hook into those so there's no there's no always scanning there's no things like hips or av over the, the traditional overhead of those applications it's just saying whenever you have internet explorer open i have a little hook that looks for these memory mess ups and it stops it when it does so it, java or ie or office zero days come out um, or attack your network or negative days and in, in some vendors say it um, if those try and execute, they'll hit the bug in whatever application it is, get to the memory corruption portion, and try and use one of these X number of paths, and emit will stop it. So it's deployable by GPO, it's free. There's a ton of, a ton of um, different protections it has. Everything from mandatory ALSR, EAF, null, um, null pages, and stuff like that. Uh, so the cool thing is that even though there are bypasses publicly known and it's talked about all over the place about how to get around EMET, the thing that every single one of these do is one, either exploit multiple bugs to get to the point of exploitation. So that way you're getting an attacker, not just a drive-by attacker, but someone who has to really go at your organization. You're forcing them, making it cost them more money or time to get into your organization. And that's what we're all about, right? Or, or you're just blocking them, right? Um, so a bypass might just go at one single protection that it has. And if you only have that one protection forced on on EMET, then it's not gonna do anything. They have the bypass for it. But if you start adding layers of protections onto this, I mean, look at that. There's, bunch, there's a ton 
of protections on there. If you slap all of these on, on just your core applications, the things that Microsoft themselves have tested against to make sure that it works, you are making it extremely hard for an attacker to get into your organization. From phishing emails to um, network-based you know, attacks. I've actually, uh, so one of the stories that I didn't tell about at ShmooCon was one of the CTFs that I made um, had a um, Windows XP um, Service Pack 2 MS0867 uh, vulnerable host sitting out on the main CTF network. It had EMET installed and, and forced onto SVC host.exe. So in in essentially, they could detect that it was vulnerable but EMET would stop any exploitation of MS-87 they tried. So it was hilarious to watch them try and do it. Yeah, I'm mean. <laughs> so the next one is um, Java application. So if a Java application is loaded by java.axe, and this is how it does it for, um, for uh, Java on web pages and, uh, and other things, the Java application is invoked by the Java plugin in that specific browser. So Chrome says, hey Java, I need you to execute this code, or hey, um, or IE says, hey Java, I need you to execute this code. But it always comes down to java.exe or java.w.exe or whatever, coming out and pulling down the code and executing it. So Internet Explorer's user agent looks like this going outbound. Awesome, right? This is a header inside of HTTP. So when the request goes outbound, it makes all of this data available to any attacker or any web page that the you know, users go to. This is what, what happens when Java goes out and pulls stuff down. So there's absolutely no way for an attacker ahead of time, and please correct me if I, I if I'm wrong, I asked a bunch of people at ShmooCon, no one could correct me on this. There's no way for an attacker ahead of time without exploiting a, a bug in the browser itself to change the, the Java user agent. So it will go outbound using this agent and asking for that class or, or JNLP or whatever have you. So the cool thing about this is that as a side note, it also shows you the version number as you can see right there, right? So any malicious website that an attacker goes to, you're, they're giving them the version number. So one of the things that I did during pen tests was I'd, I'd load a uh, fake class file or jar file, whatever, that did absolutely nothing. Had it signed, it looked all legit, and as soon as it got loaded, um, I got the Java user agent, and with some horrible PHP coding, I made it say, if this user agent is seen, use this exploit. If this user agent is seen, use this exploit. So it was really customized to specific user agents based on the initial uh, request from them. So that's the Java user agent being used. Obvious, right? So the, what's the goal of this? If you block the Java user agent at your perimeter, then the user is never prompted for this. And we all trust the user to click cancel, right? I don't see many shaking heads, yeah. <laughs> right. Or the click to play 9,000 times now that Java 732 makes it click to play like 20 times just to hit run. But they'll still do it. If, if your users can download an encrypted zip, use the password in that zip to then export an AXC and run it, they will just, they'll do this as well. Yes, I've seen that happen. So um, how do you do this at an enterprise? How do, how do you make it scale, right? It's, it's impossible for, um, for most of these organizations that say, here's my, you know, here's my box, here's my defense against the, the black arts of, of hackers um, to scale really well unless you buy a bunch of boxes. Well, this is free, right? You can, you can initiate this using a, a squid install, um, but 90% of the time you'll have Java developers in your organization say, no, I don't, but I use Java. Well, run a 30 day, one week, five day, seven, you know, seven hour, depending on the size of your organization, um, dump of all of the domains that use this Java user agent, and you'll be surprised that the only things you see in there are webex.com, gotomeeting.com, java.com, 
oracle.com and sun.com and that's it so if you exclude those from the block you say here's my you know my exemption list from that block you've essentially blocked all possible attacks against java now a lot of people in this you know uh, industry don't like um, a hundred percent or whatever they are you know um, but it's just true like there's no way to to modify that user agent ahead of time it also works on SSL which is awesome if you have a proxy if you don't have a proxy or you have an invisible proxy obviously you're not going to see this but if you're using a, a proxy which you should be in your organization and we'll talk about that in a second you'll see a connect to java.com with the user agent java dot or java1624 or if you have really horrible developers 1426 <laughs> Um, oh yeah, and it protects Max too because one of the there's only two targets on Max right now, Java, and uh, I think Max have uh, officially disabled Java on the browser plugins. No, yes, maybe yes. so. Yeah. Okay. So then you also have Safari, and there's no protecting Safari. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. This is where I kind of get on my soapbox a little bit. The things that we already know and we don't do well in the organizations. Um, if you see PW dump getting removed from an IIS box on your organization and it was successfully removed, is the game done? No, no it's not. Thank you. One person's like, no. And everybody's like, no, it, it removed it, right? Because that's what I see in organizations. They'll, they'll, they'll have their AV report and everything's been removed. Great. Except for PW dump like on a domain controller, really bad. On an IS box, really bad. If, if that tool got on there, there's, it got there somehow. It didn't just magically appear off of I, you know, someone tried to download it off the internet and it ran. No, nine times out of 10, that is not the case. Um, so I recommend um, in your AV products, you make special alerting for any hacker tools. Almost all of them have that category of hacker tools. Change the whole alert category all the way up to critical for that. Now, you are gonna get some false positives where someone downloads um, angry IP scanner to the, from the internet down to their box. Deal with that. But if it's PW dump or stuff like that, you really need to say you know what happened. The next one is AD Audit Plus, uh, login alerting. How many in the room, just as a raise of hands, um, alert on positive logon attempts, successful logon attempts? Liars. Um, so if in a successful logon attempt, you get a bunch of data, uh, especially if people do it a lot, right? So if, um, if your local administrator logs down to 30 different servers um, in rapid succession, would that cause you any alarm? Yes, it should. Um, because that's what an attacker is going to do. There's been multiple, multiple people talking about like IOCs and how, the, and how um, attackers move around networks. It's normally with credentials. So if, you, if, um, if Joe Bob A logs on from from Europe and his uh, his Outlook calendar says he's supposed to be somewhere in China, there's a problem. So that's one of the cool things that AD Audit Plus does. This is the only tool that I'm gonna be talking about that's actually cost money, but it does some amazing things. Like there was a um, uh, an instance where the guy I was doing a pen test for um, had AD Audit Plus and not only did it say, hey, he's, um, the XYZ account was logged into four different servers in the last three seconds because I'm, uh, I was being stupid and going way too fast. Um, would you like to change the password? So from his like bed at two o'clock in the morning, it got, he got an alert and he said yes and it changed the password to a random password and the next day he got to um, solve the problem or, or find me. Wow. 
for me, I noticed that the account was, the password has changed and I, and I started freaking out as an attacker because I don't know how they got that information. So I started logging out of systems and, and backtracking it and saying, oh, oh crap, they've got me. So looking at other things. So the psychological aspect to um, positive locking is also there. Hips. Host intrusion prevention system. Not IDS, not HIDS, HIPS. So a lot of people have HIPS installed on their um, computers at work. I would recommend making that P a more prevalent, prevalent uh, portion of that. Uh, I've, I can't tell you how many places I've been or pen tested that don't have that P turned on. And now there is an understandable reason for that. It does break things. Um, so what I, what I suggest is doing the same thing as AV, where I say, turn on the P portion for at least the hacker tool categories or the, the things that are definitely, definitely things that you don't want them to do. Um, one, one HIPS has the ability to see PW dump or password dumping or attempts to do, access that portion of the LSAS and, and registries. Um, if you turn that on, not only will you get alerted, but they won't get that information. That's passwords that they can start using around your network. Then you're going to have to detect with AD Audit Plus, right? So stop them at, as soon as you can. Vuln scanning versus Vuln reporting. This is where I get even higher up on my, uh, my soapbox. <sighs> How many in the room do vulnerability scanning? Just pushing buttons on Nessus and, and, and figuring it out, right? How many people um, <laughs> actually look at that data before they send it off to whoever is you know, in charge of that stuff? Liars. <laughs> um, so, one of the important things about this, uh, about vulnerability scanning, is that your Koalas, Nessus, Tenable, and all of the other Nexpos, Rapid7 people um, do is they generalize as best they can. And that's not no fault to them. They don't know your organization. So if there's MS-87 uh, on a box in Triple E and it never talks to anything but this other box, which is in freaking uh, Iwo Jima, and it's not connected to anything, but your phone scan is supposed to scan it, who cares? Like, it's never gonna, you know, be a huge risk for you. Um, however, if, you're, if the top 10 vulnerabilities in your organization are Apache, PHP, CGI on, on all of your Red Hat boxes, and that's what you're giving people to fix and find maintenance windows for, you have problems. Um, so what I suggest is taking your pen test teams, taking your red teams, um, and even if you're a small business, when you get that pen test or PCI test or whatever, you go up and say, hey, after the report's done, thank you so much for that information, or I hate you because you found all this information, however you greet your red teamers and pen testers. And then afterwards say, I have this vulnerability scan for this part of my organization or my whole organization. Could you look at the vulnerabilities on this real quick just take 30 minutes out of your time and give me your two cents give me tell me just a little bit about what you think is exploitable that 30 minutes of time is going to be way way more valuable than your pen test and i hate to say that because i'm a pen tester red teamer and stuff but it's true if you still have a bunch of things on your vulnerability scan um, you're not ready for a pen test anyways so moving on to crowdsourcing security. Um, this, this was actually uh, an idea that spawned off of Ben 10. Um, he did a DerbyCon talk a while back about uh, incentivizing phishing um, in programs. Um, and I've kind of expanded that into um, not only phishing, but security incidents in general. Um, and instead of doing like $5 gift cards or stuff for everyone who reports a phishing exercise, I think that it should be more of and, and financially easier to do like monthly or quarterly like top 10 users that report stuff. So then it becomes a competition. Um, so what do I mean by this? I mean, when someone reports a phishing email, what happens in your organization? And anyone who can do the cricket sound, please do it now. Um, cricket. 
Um, that's usually what happens is, is someone who's trying to do the good thing and report that there was a phishing email sends it off to spam at company.com or security at company.com and they get nothing back. Zero. Well, if if we take anything from Frank Eliason who created Comcast Cares and really started the huge uh, like crowdsourcing Twitter movement, um, it's that feedback and, and instantaneous or quick feedback is the key to getting people involved. And um, while I do hate the whole um, user awareness training stuff because normally it's mind blowing click, 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 uh, where do I get the certification? Um, or hacking flash to get to the end to go to the certification. <laughs> yeah, I know you guys do it. Um, <laughs> so, um, what I suggest is, is essentially um, starting programs where there's a reward for people, not only for reporting stuff, but uh, a response to that. So, um, have someone on the other end of that email address that knows where that stuff can go, either to the help desk or to the security team or the incident response team, especially if they say, hey, I clicked it. That takes a lot from a user to do, to admit that they were wrong. If you don't give them any feedback, they're not gonna report that again. So losing that chance is a big deal, and, and that's our failing. Um, and if you get them not only incentivized, but into a competition to become that top user who gets a $100 gift card for Amazon or whatever every quarter or, or month, um, or just goes out to lunch with the CSO, if they get to go out to lunch with the CSO and, and that's all expenses paid to the best you know best restaurant in the area, that's awesome. That that not only is incentive for you know free food, which is awesome, but it gets it gives them a chance to get in front of that CSO or that CXO, and it's very low cost for the company. Um, the last bit on here is the Think Evil games. Um, this was only done in one organization that I know of, but it's, it, it was an amazing catalyst for security change. Essentially what this is, is a quarterly um, day where you are allowed and without repercussion to report how you got around security controls. controls. So, um, you would be surprised how, how well that helped uh, an organization. If I can, if I can get around um, the, the firewall to get to Facebook or to my house so I can stream movies, I guarantee all of the people in your organization know that network better than you and how to get around it because the grapevine, or as we called it in, um, in the Marine Corps, the Lance Corporal Network, um, they know how to get around those controls. If you give them a chance to report those things, and not only give them a chance to do that, but give that feedback, incentivize it, and, and then um, show them a, a safe way to do it, then you've created a uh, every single person in, in your company into an IDS, into a reporting mechanism that will give you zero false positives. Nine times out of 10, they're gonna give you valid things that you can go and work on. And one real quick thing, make it, and I, I kind of glanced over it, make it so that there are no repercussions on that day, right? Say, hey, we want you to tell us about these things. We're not gonna, you know, if you found a way to get to porn on, on the corporate network, we just wanna know how you did it. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not gonna get in trouble for it. <laughs> Um, so crowdsourcing security goes a little further too. So bug bounty programs, um, if, if your developers have an internal bug bounty program already, great on, uh, awesome on you, that's great. But what if uh, a user on your network changes a one to a two and can get to you know, user two or employee two's benefits and they did this accidentally? Where do they go to report that? Do you have a bugs at company.com? Probably not. And the thing is the, about this entire crowdsourcing security aspect, if you don't make it public, if you don't make a big deal out of this, no one's gonna know how to do that. Like, 
I've been at organizations where I sent spam at company.com just assuming that that was a thing and got a bounce back. Then I tried to send it at security at company.com and I got a bounce and then I stopped, right? You're missing an opportunity because if people don't know where to send things, and if you don't make it easy for the people to report things, um, you're, you're losing a huge opportunity. Um, port forwarding honey pots. So this is, this is actually something that you should start doing after you have security under control for the most part. Honey pots are, are, should, should only be something that you do at a later date. Um, but one of the ways that you can do this without endangering your, your organization, because I don't know many CSOs or CIOs or CTOs that'll, that'll approve you putting something intentionally vulnerable on their network. It's just not like they'll look at you like you're an idiot. So a way to circumvent this or help to help this out is, is take your main website or, or a bunch of your main websites and say, uh, okay, it needs port 80, it needs port 443 to talk. But if it doesn't need 8080, go ahead and use your firewall to port forward it outbound to a VPS. That attacker will think, hey, I found Tomcat, game over. Well, if you run Tomcat on that VPS and they start doing things, you could possibly get tools that they use, techniques that they're trying to use, and all of these other things. And all you have to do is flip a switch to, to revert it um, after you've gotten that intel and game's over for them. Uh, and they'll think, because of the port forward, that they're attacking your main website. And they'll do things that they normally wouldn't have done. So if they find 8080 on, on some random IP that you own, they might um, do less stuff because they think they're in, in a honeypot. But if it's their main website, nine times out of 10 or 100% or of the time, they're gonna do more, right? Just as an attacker, I know that if I'm if I found Tomcat on someone, you know, www.google.com, oh yeah, I'm going there. Um, WPAD, this is a stupid simple one. Um, if you don't know about the tool Responder, if I sit on your network for 20 seconds and WPAD is, is installed, I will have clear text credentials to your network in five minutes. Um, and all it is is a checkbox. Like, why isn't it why is this still a thing why do i get on networks still where this is still a thing i don't understand it's so easy to fix um you can one gpo change it and that doesn't always work but um, at least make the change inside of your gpo it takes 20 seconds and if not null route it just say 127.0.0.1 is wpad on your networks again 27 20 second fix that'll take an insider's automatic set of creds and make it nullified. You can't do it anymore. Also, if you can, if you're, now, if you're on a, a network that still uses Windows 98, <laughs> you, can't, you can't disable NetBIOS completely because it needs it. Um, but if you have moved on to Windows NT or after, <laughs> Um, you can actually disable NetBIOS and your DNS servers will do just fine. Um, I do know of organizations who still need Windows 98. Um, so if you are in that situation, just net, turn off NetBIOS for all of your Windows 7 machines or Windows 8 machines, and then um, make a specific GPO that allows NetBIOS for those uh, Windows 98 machines. DNS, turn off DNS. Just go ahead and turn it off. Like, that's all you have to do. No? Wow. They're like, okay. No, um, internally, there's no, absolutely no reason for, um, for a user to be able to ping Google. If they said ping google.com, it, it should come back as could not resolve. The reason this is true is because, one, if you're using a proxy, and you should, all of the anything that is proxy compliant can go through that proxy and do DNS through the proxy. If not, then it's usually malware that's using DNS as a callback. Well, if you want to stop now, so I'll stop real quick. One of the um, one of the things that I did when I first joined um, 
a company was uh, that's actually doing this was say, hey, hey guys, I, I just joined the red team. Check out this cool piece of malware I wrote. Look at how this works. And I ran it. And it used DNS as a C2 and I thought it was all cool and stuff and it didn't work. And then they were like, hey, wasn't it supposed to do something? <laughs> like, yeah, why isn't it working? And I felt stupid. Um, so what, and this so essentially turning off um, forwarding on your Windows DNS servers um, so that it doesn't go outbound and, and find Google and stuff um, stops a whole category of C2, right? So it makes it so that DNS is not a way that people can go around. And DNS is routinely a very th hard thing to um, not only log, but look through and, and find malware in. And the cool thing about this is if you do turn it off, uh, malware that can't or tries to do C2 is now the only thing hitting your DNS servers looking for outbound stuff. So then it, your logs go from ginormous things that look for everything down to only pieces of malware and people who try to ping Google. Um, next up is uh, passwords. Uh, raise your hand if you actually do password auditing inside of your organization and keep it raised. Now, now what? Now lower your um, hand if you don't do password auditing on your IP cameras. Lower your hand if you don't do password auditing on your IP cameras. Lower your hand if you don't do password auditing on your Cisco devices. Two, three. All right, so we, there's, as a community we talk about password auditing, and mostly it's, you know, Windows but you would not believe how many times on an organization the first thing I hit is the IP camera and log in via admin admin or the or the uh, printer which is also admin admin or admin blank or admin Epson or <laughs> whatever and you know what these those things are computers they basically are embedded systems that can run FTP SMB and all kinds of other things and their hard drives have copies of everyone's tax returns, yes. Um, so these are the, the common passwords that uh, Chris Gates, who I stole this um, slide from, uh, and who works at Lara's, so if you need pen tests, go to him. Um, uh, unless your passwords are those. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just use John the Ripper. Um, set up a John the Ripper thing that's connected to your domain controller or, or, or um, another system just off the network, make sure it's off the network every time other than when it's grabbing credentials um, because you don't want your pen testers to find it. Um, there was actually one, um, one pen test I did a long time ago where we found a, um, an LC4 file on one of the shares. Anyone know what LC4 is? Lofprac. Saved. So not the, just the hashes, all the ones that are managed to crack. So the cool thing about that was that right alongside in the same share was a copy of a um, pirated version of Loftrack. <laughs> <laughs> so what did we do? We copied both, <laughs> ran them in a VM, and it worked. Woohoo! So don't pirate Loftrack. They have actually an awesome um, suite of stuff, and, and Dildog's an amazing guy. Um, and he's doing some pretty cool stuff with uh, the recent versions and the GPU versions of, of Loftcrack. Um, so getting back on track, uh, if you don't know how to do password cracking, and it, it is a fine skill, either ask Hank to do it or your pen testers. Um, um, they will jump at the chance to try it. Um, just don't let them keep copies of it for other pen tests. Uh, and getting close to the end here, authenticated splash proxies. Um, how many of you were actually in the talk uh, at SmooCon that I did? So um, authenticated splash proxies. So first off, authenticated proxies. Let's just break this down first. Authenticated proxies, if you have an authenticated proxy, that means that your users have to authenticate to the proxy before they can get outbound. 
If you are using Digest, NTLM, or Basic Auth for your proxy, that means that the Windows system that's doing that can automatically forward those, those credentials on as a single sign-on method to the proxy. Well, guess what an attacker can do? Also do that with one line of C coding or a couple of lines. Um, it makes it very easy. Well, if you have a proxy that does web authentication where you have to type in a bunch of things like username and password and whatever, um, that makes it much harder for any kind of C2 to figure that out. They have to know your organization. Um, and if you can, um, I don't know how many um, proxies have an uncategorized. I don't work at an enterprise level proxy vendor, but uh, I know that Zscaler and a few other large scale um, uh, companies like, uh, what's another one? Blue Coat, Blue Coat and, and uh, Cisco WCCC or whatever it is. Um, can also do categorization. Please block uncategorized. And the other thing is, please block IP, direct IP stuff, because that is just too easy for me to go, okay, you're blocking all uncategorized, I'm just going to switch to IP and go directly outbound because the categorization on, on IPs don't work. And uh, <coughs> Blue Coat <coughs> doesn't do it. Um, I'm kidding. If, there's, if the CSO of Blue Coat is online right now and watching this, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so, uh, splash, page, splash page requirements. Uh, this is a little bit uh, kind of a, of a newfangled way of doing things, although the company that I worked for that did it was back in like 2009, 2008 timeframe. Um, instead of doing categorization, instead of allowing domains through, what you can do is say all domains are blocked and just leave it at that and then no one can ever get exploited, right? Um, but instead of doing um, categorization, why not make it so that every domain is blocked every day and then pushing it onto the users to allow those through. Now, that might be a little scary, um, but if you allow just one user to be the, the catalyst for it, um, essentially what I mean is they get this when they log into uh, a web page that or a domain that hasn't been used before. Now once they click unblock, they, are, they allow it for the entire company. So the other th cool thing is um, you're, you're doing a little bit of a psychological twerk on them um, to say uh, that you are allowing this for the entire domain or the entire company. Are you sure you want to do this? Um, so if they go to facebook.com or that porn site.com or, or whatever, they will, they, there's more of a chance that they're going to not allow this through and click block or get me out of there. Um, so how this works is essentially a one, one user goes to google.com in the morning and then for the rest of the day, um, for the company that I work for, uh, for the rest of the day, it was unblocked for everyone. So no one got the splash page after that. Um, and it worked incredibly well. Like you only saw this page once or twice a day or if you're Googling for some kind of solution to something, um, now that Stack Overflow is pretty popular, that's only one domain, but when you were Googling for a solution for something, you'd probably hit this five or six times. But if you change this to um, a week long set or just put a few as an exclusions in, you're going to get a lot a lot, um, lot less user interaction on these things that need. Um, but what, what is this going to give you? What is this going to stop? Well, pretty much every single C2 on the planet that uses HTTP or HTTPS, right? If, if there's not a user to unblock this stuff, like, I don't know how many C2 right now, and, and I'm not a malware analyst, but how many C2 currently pop up a window for the users to, to do something on every time they want to run something. I'm guessing not that many. So if you do this um, and you allow, allow the users to actually help you with security, then, um, then you, are, uh, you are enabling them in another way. And it will block a lot of the CTU and, and infrastructure. And the great thing is, if you find a lot of um, uh, a lot of 
domains that's being trying to access and they neither click the block or unblock, you start getting intelligence on C2 that is trying to get outbound but can't because of it. And then finally, what everybody actually stayed for for the talk was the Evil Canaries. Because um, these are just funny. And these are, um, I don't know of many organizations who, or, or um, people who talk about how they got caught on pen tests because it's really not very lucrative for them to pe tell people, yeah, I got caught in this way. Um, or uh, ask any pen tester how, how often they get in. They'll say, 100% of the time. And how often do they get caught? Never because they want to sell you, you know, their services. Well, I get caught all the time, um, and I'm okay with that, because that challenges me to get better. So first one is the no domain user that was called domain admin temp. Inside of domain admin temp, the comment for that user was, I have this password. And guess how many times I clicked or tried to use that authentication? <laughs> like 20 or 30 times. But the logon user hours for it, if I would have just paid attention to the, the, the account, if logon hours were zero, that means I can't log on any time with that credential. And what happened was that user was set to critical logging. Failed or successful attempts any time of the day were sent up to the, um, the security staff and I instantly got caught. Um, the cool thing about this is it's a set it and forget it. Like you can literally make this account one time in like 2009, just let it sit. And I guarantee that <laughs> every attacker on the planet is going to look for this and see it and try and use it. And if you have standard, user, standard users who try and use this stuff, that's also a conversation you need to have. <laughs> um, public share, uh, this was a, a share that was just sitting out there on the domain and uh, said password audit 2000 and whatever. And then inside of that share, because everyone could access it, was a uh, CSV um, file that was an Excel document that had the entire password dump or fake password dump. It was four megs that I could never access. So I didn't know what was actually in there, but it was just a CSV file with four megs of something that um, the permission on it was everyone deny. And if you know anything about Windows permissioning, um, deny statements override everything else. So I clicked on that probably 40,000 times trying to change permissions on it and do all these kinds of things. And I think I, I dosed the security team by sending them so many emails about it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this next one is a bit esoteric. It's a little harder to do. Um, but the first two are essentially set it and forget it, right? It's really easy to make these things and just let them go. Let them, you know, reel those attackers in. Um, the next one is uh, there was a pack backup database server. It was called Backup Database. And it had a really, really out of date MySQL with uh, uh, Lazl or whatever it is um, enabled on it. So I thought I was golden. I thought I was totally good on it. But they, were, they had removed like 80% of the DLLs uh, that allowed this thing to do authentication or even operate, but it still worked well enough. Um, so as soon as I tried to log into it, it would say, I don't know how to you know, do this. And, and it would actually say successful login, but I'd never get anything after that. Um, and what they had was alerting for anyone trying to log into it at all, automatically sent up to you know, security and, and alerting. And of course, I tried, now that I knew it was successful login, I tried about 5,000 different ways to get into it um, and never did, obviously. Um, this next one was not a security person who did it. Um, it was actually a web developer trying to be funny. Um, so <laughs> it wasn't really funny. Um, <laughs> So the .ht access file, if you don't know, um, with mod rewrite allows you to um, forward or change how a website um, uh, deals with inbound requests. And what he did was it made, so he ran like Nikto against it, took all of those uh, 404s that his page had and, and put them into a file, an HT access file, to reroute into a 402 page. Which may basically is a 402, if you haven't never seen it, is payment required. So essentially, you want to scan my uh, website, pay me. Um, 
And the cool thing is, and he, he was just a web developer, um, so he was not a security guy at all, but he correlated all the hits on this and sent it off to security um, by default. Uh, so I was caught on that, trying to scan the website through Tor, and um, they knew where I was coming from and, uh, and the tool I used, but I didn't get any good information out of it because it just basically dosed my, my, uh, my tool, right? It saw all the 402s and thought they were good and started alerting everything was good. Um, the next one is a credit card database. Uh, this actually came from a, a colleague of mine who um, jumped on a credit card processing um, system and uh, it was a uh, Oracle database and it had a bunch of different databases but one was called credit cards and it was like okay zero in that one that's the one I want um, and this credit card database was filled with all these credit cards valid credit cards well I thought valid or he thought valid at the time um, but they were just generated from getcreditcard.com and threw in there and set on high alert. Now all the Oracle database admins and, and the application admins knew what that was and they never touched it. So as soon as anyone accessed that database, it was high alert. Another set it and forget it. And this next one really, really, really pissed me off. Um, so there was a VPN that you looked at the source of the VPN page and it had default credentials in it, like in the, in the commented text. So I automatically tried those credentials it, and it successfully allowed you to log in. Well, it didn't give you anything else. It didn't give you an application to run or network connectivity. It didn't give you anything. All it did was say, oh, hi, welcome to the VPN. Um, go away and alerted to the security staff, which was really, really annoying. Um, the next one uh, probably pissed me off the most of all of these. Um, there was a slash admin slash login.html. It had three form fields, user, password, and domain. I thought I was good. I thought, you know, it was basically a, a way to run. It was a test page that allowed you to run code um, in PHP uh, and, and binaries directly from it. But you had to log in first. So I had done a fish earlier in that day or that week and got a bunch of credentials from the from the uh, users, but I hadn't gotten any shells from them. Um, so I, I, as soon as I saw this page, I was like, I'm going to try every single set of credentials that I had for the domain on this thing so I could run code, see who actually has the ability to do it. Well, every single login attempt said success, so I thought I was good, but um, no one had permissions to do it. Well, what I was doing was actually giving the security team all of the credentials that I had fished <laughs> And allowing them to change the passwords on them and notice that it did it, which was not not fun for me. Um, and there was a uh, one guy, a colleague of mine, who um, set up a. Uh, he's now a colleague of mine because we hired him off of off of the team that did this. Um, and we he set up a system that did absolutely nothing. It had no ports open and did absolutely nothing, and. Um, the, the uh, thing that it did was as soon as it saw a SYN ACK that wasn't a broadcast, someone who was trying to scan the network, it would automatically report on it. And this, it was just sitting right next to them on a system, and that's all it did. It's, um, and it's on a screen by itself. So he saw that a, a, a SYN ACK was happening or uh, attempting to happen for port 23. He traced it down to the MAC address and, and IP that it came from and found out that the red team was in the next room um, doing their test against them, walked in and said, hey guys, how's it going? We got gotcha. And then we hired him. <laughs> and finally, um, one of the things that we do as pen testers and as security people is try and talk to you know admin staff and, and managers and stuff like that and, and speak their language. Well, we need to start speaking backwards as well or sideways as well to the um, to our colleagues in the help desk. If they don't know about the ways that we do security, um, we are failing because they are our first line of defense. There's if you talk to anyone in incident response, nine times out of ten, it's the third party notification of things that actually gets um, the, the initial response started. And that's it. Thank you very much. Um, and you guys have awesome time. We are lunch is ready. We are going to lunch.
This has been a presentation of Nova Hackers at ShmooCon Epilogue 2014, hosted by Mach 37, brought to you by ComputeCycle, video recording and streaming services provided by Cranial Thunder Productions.